Attention! This makes absolutely no sense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sanders Facts. Oh, hey, y'all. What's going on? Welcome into Xander's Facts. I am, of course, the aforementioned Xander. And no, this is not a new Xander's Facts podcast episode. This week, we are doing another Xander's Facts flashback. Are you sure? We are going back in time to a previous Xander's Facts podcast with a topic that is very informative. With a lot of facts that I think you should know about. So, I'm doing that this week. A new Xander's Facts podcast. Flashback. But remember, if you've liked all the previous episodes of the Xander's Facts podcast and you think you're going to like the facts on the Xander's Facts flashback, remember to follow the podcast, the podcast Xander's Facts, download this episode, rate and review the podcast, and then go on all your socials Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Xander's Facts, that's Xander with a Z. Check out all the stuff I'm posting on there. And then remember to tell all your friends, spread the facts! We call it spreading the facts around here. Tell all your friends about the Xander's Facts podcast and this week's Xander's Facts flashback, which is also on YouTube. If you want to go check out Xander's Facts on YouTube, you should do that. You should also check out Xander's Weekend Facts, which is a recap of the week's top headlines every Sunday morning in newsletter form so you can read the facts on Substack. The link is in this episode's description and you can sign up to get it in your email inbox every Sunday morning. It's totally free. You should check it out. Xander's Weekend Facts. And all the links you need for Xander's Facts are on the link tree, Xander's Facts link tree, on this episode's description. It is linked below. You should check out that because it is all the Xander's Facts links that you need. So there you go. Check out everything you need for Xander's Facts, including all of our past episodes, including episode 72, which we did two weeks ago with our Xander's Facts soccer analyst, Emma Adams. We previewed the club soccer season, which is kind of starting in full force right now. We are already into the Premier League season. All the European leagues are winding up, ready to go. So if you want to know about the soccer season, check out episode 72 of the podcast. Let's do it. But this week, we are doing another Xander's Facts flashback. And last week, we had another one where we talked about Ukraine from March of 2022, which you should go listen to. But this week, we are going back to November 2021, specifically our Thanksgiving episode at the end of November, when we talked about everything green energy, electric vehicles, solar panels, wind, hydro, all that stuff, green energy, clean energy. It was a green Thanksgiving last year on the Xander's Facts podcast. And now in August, it's a green August. How about that? But green, clean energy is all the hype right now. And for good reason because it's not killing our planet so i thought i would put all the stuff green energy clean energy everything about it into a podcast and i did that back in thanksgiving and now i'm about to replay what i said in that podcast in case you missed it so here we go let's get to it clean green energy on this week's xander's facts flashback Xander's Facts. Green energy. Let's talk about it because we've talked a bunch about climate change on this podcast, but we haven't really talked a lot about what we can do about it because we're talking about all these crazy things about climate change. Oh my gosh, it's terrible. Terrible. Well, what are we going to do about it? Well, today that changes because we're going to be talking about all the ways that we as regular earthling human beings can help mitigate the effects of climate change. There are a ton of things we're going to talk about that you may not have ever heard of, or you may not want to, but you're going to. I don't care. We're talking about this this week to make sure that you're aware that there are things that us mere mortals can do to help the environment, because it's kind of struggling right now. So while you think, you may think you're only one person, and that doesn't make much of a difference. Well, there are 330 million Americans. There's nearly eight billion people living on earth but once more and more people begin helping when begin doing things that we're going to talk about on this podcast today it's going to begin to make a difference that's going to help all of us what am i talking about climate change because if you haven't heard in the news recently there was this 
Climate Conference Summit that was happening over in Scotland. It was called the COP, C-O-P, 26 Conference. That's been in the news recently. So before we get into all the things we can do about climate change, let's talk about this recent conference because it was kind of important. Tell me, tell me! The 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, or COP26, was the 26th edition of this conference, and it was held over in Scotland from October 31st until November 13th. And the goal of the summit was to present a plan agreed upon by the members of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the UNFCC, to limit global warming rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. We've talked about this on this podcast. It was billed as the most important climate summit since the talks that led to the Paris Climate Accord back in 2017. And during the summit, Climate Action Tracker came out with a report that showed that the Earth's average temperature would increase by 2.4 degrees Celsius by the year 2100 if we keep going the way we are, which is, of course, not very good. Whoops. And with this data, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is IPCC, which is a part of the UNFCCC, which we were talking about, said that the global emissions must be cut by 45% by 2030 in order to achieve the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal. So for context, if global carbon emissions continue at the current rates, they would rise by 13.7% by 2030. So we definitely kind of need to cut those. Pretty bad stuff. So what actually ended up coming of this conference? What came out of it? Well. Nothing to the level of the Paris Climate Agreement that was back in 2015, but there was some progress made during the two-week-long conference. There were a lot of negotiations between countries not wanting to cut emissions as much as other countries. There were a bunch of smaller countries who wanted the larger countries to actually pay for damages that those larger countries have brought upon the smaller countries because of global warming and climate change. That did not materialize, but several countries created their own goals regarding cutting emissions. India announced that they would plan to reach net zero emissions by 2070, and India is heavily reliant on coal, so that was kind of a big deal. Saudi Arabia announced their plans for net zero emissions by 2060, so did China, and Brazil by 2050. And there were over 100 countries that signed a pledge during the summit to cut methane emissions by 30%. By 2030. That's methane, not total emissions. And several countries also agreed to cease deforestation by 2030, including two heavily forested countries, Brazil and Russia. In addition, the US and China announced that they would work together to strengthen and accelerate climate action and cooperation. This is the first time that those two countries announced that they would work together to fight climate change. And this was the first time that the U.S. was back on the global stage promoting actions to fight climate change since 2016, because last four years, you remember, there was a boy in the White House who didn't believe climate change was real. What? But altogether, the various pledges taken still most likely won't be enough to limit the Earth's warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100. Instead, though, the International Energy Agency estimated that if every country committed to the pledges that they agreed to at COP26, the Earth would warm by 1.8 degrees Celsius by 2100, which is still better than what the Earth would warm to if countries kept emitting at current levels, which would be 2.7 degrees Celsius, or about 5 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be horrible. This is true. So the conference was not as big a success as some had hoped, but there was still a bunch of progress that was made, and there's still a lot of work to do. And the world, all these countries are going to reconvene once again next year for COP27. It's a yearly summit. They're doing it next year in Egypt. Plus, if you want to have a more in-depth look at all the effects that climate change could bring, like I'm throwing numbers at you, one and a half degrees Celsius, five degrees Fahrenheit, you don't know what those mean, well, go back to episode 28 of this podcast. It's titled... Code Red for Humanity. Same as Bog. That's episode 28. We talked about all the effects that climate change could bring because there was a new UN report back in August that detailed climate change. And we looked at that and how it would affect our lives. So we talked about that. Go listen back to episode 28 if you have not. But if you have, 
then let's continue on our wonderful journey talking about green energy because now we know what countries are trying to do. We'll see if that happens. But what are some of the ways that we can mitigate climate change on a global scale, on a local scale, on an individual scale? You know, since we know that climate change is happening because it is real and is having seriously negative effects on our world, we need to be taking measures to help mitigate its effects. That's what the whole COP26 summit was about. So luckily, there are a bunch of ways we can do exactly that. In fact, that's what this whole podcast is devoted to. Nine minutes in, we're finally getting into what this podcast is about. Here we go. So let's get into it. The change that we need to make the most. Basically, the big main change that we have to do. Getting away from non-renewable resources and transitioning over towards using renewable resources and energy sources. Almost everything that we're going to be discussing revolves around green and renewable energy. Because green energy is the future, people! And it's also energy that's created from natural resources like sunlight, water, wind, all that stuff. And these are resources that can be used for eternity. Like, they're not going to run out as long as we're here. Plus, using them does not harm the environment. Win, 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 win! Are you sure? But in 2020, renewable energy only accounted for 12% of the total U.S. energy consumption. And that percentage obviously needs to increase in the United States. And it also does not include natural gas, which many have debated whether or not it is a renewable resource. And depending on what you look at, natural gas is either considered renewable or non-renewable. And natural gas can be created from fossil fuels, which then emit into the air and are considered non-renewable. So that kind of natural gas is non-renewable. But a type of natural gas called biomethane is considered renewable. This type of natural gas is created from materials that it's gathered from landfills, livestock, wastewater, other areas. Ew. However, even though this is considered a renewable resource, this type of natural gas still pollutes, not maybe not as much as other types of natural gas or gas or coal or whatever, but it still pollutes. So that's not a very viable long-term option. But with that out of the way, let's talk about renewable energy sources that do not pollute. There are five main types of renewable energy sources that we're going to be talking about. So all these resources have an infinite amount left, meaning we can use them hopefully as long as the earth is around. And in addition, they do not, or rarely do they, pollute when they are created or used, meaning we can keep using them and they will release far fewer or even no emissions into our environment, which is a good thing. So let's talk about these five renewable energy sources, the big five, what they are and how we can use them in our daily lives, some of them. But let's start out with two of the lesser known green energy sources, geothermal and biomass. Get ready. Let's begin with geothermal because geothermal energy is thermal energy, which is heat, that is stored under the Earth's crust. And this is considered a renewable resource because heat is continually being produced inside of the Earth. And this heat is generated, it was generated, when Earth first formed, as well as from the radioactive decay of materials. It's stored in rocks and fluids like water and magma down inside Earth, and it accounted for 22% of the renewable energy consumed in the U.S. last year. How about that? But the issue with geothermal energy is that it's all underground, so we need to drill down, sometimes miles, into the ground to get to the underground reservoirs, and that can be expensive. Get that dough! But we do have some other easy ways to get geothermal energy, too. Ever heard of hot springs, geysers, volcanoes? Those all release geothermal energy from deep in the earth. In fact, the largest geothermal development in the world is the geysers, which is north of San Francisco. Iceland has nearly 25 active volcanoes and 600 hot springs, so almost 25% of Iceland's energy comes from only five geothermal power plants in the country. How about that? Plus... The geothermal energy that's stored under the United States would be able to produce 10 times as much electricity as coal can right now. So how about that? So while there are easy ways to be able to find geothermal energy, it is largely location dependent, with production usually limited to areas that are near tectonic plate boundaries, which then 
There's a fear that they could increase the occurrence of earthquakes, which hasn't exactly been proved, but we don't know, so that's a whole thing we'd have to sort out. Plus, even though geothermal power plants are much less expensive to maintain than current fossil fuel power plants, along with being much more environmentally friendly, drilling and finding the energy underground is very expensive. And while there's an abundance of geothermal energy that doesn't harm the environment, actually getting to it may be a drawback that instead promotes other types of renewable energy. And one of those other types of energy is bioenergy. Bioenergy is a renewable energy that is derived from biomass. And biomass is a renewable organic material that comes from plants and animals. Did you know that up until the mid-1800s, biomass was the largest source of total U.S. energy consumption annually? If you say so. Biomass accounted for 39% of the renewable energy that was consumed in the U.S. in the year 2020. So how about that? Biomass includes chemical energy that is stored from the sun, and then plants are then able to produce biomass through photosynthesis, which we all learned about in elementary school, hopefully. Biomasses then can either be burned to generate heat immediately, or they can be converted into renewable liquids and gaseous fuels. The most common example of biomass would be using wood in a fireplace, which a lot of people do. However, there are many ways to generate energy from biomass. In addition to firewood, wood pellets, wood chips, lumber, and sawdust and waste from furniture mills are sources of biomass generating from wood. But biomass can also come from agricultural crops and waste materials like corn, soybeans, and algae. It can also come from biogenic materials and municipal solid waste like paper, cotton, and wool products along with food, yard, and wood waste. And it also comes from animal manure and human sewage, just to let you know. Spitting the truth. So we can burn biomass in order to create heat immediately, which is what we do to create a fire in the fireplace, or we can convert biomass into fuel. And this creates biofuels such as ethanol, biodiesel, and the aforementioned renewable natural gas. Right now, the biggest limitation to using biomass, though, is the lack of technology that we need to use it widespread. And in addition, using biomass to create energy creates carbon dioxide. However, since plant regeneration consumes the same amount of carbon dioxide, it creates a balanced atmosphere, which is a good thing. And nevertheless, biomass is a clean and intuitive way to create energy that is probably going to be more and more important going forward. So keep that in mind, biomass. So we've got two main energy sources down. The next one is water, because water can also be used as a clean energy source, most commonly known as hydropower or hydroelectric. This energy is created just by using water. Sure about that? And a common way of producing hydroelectric power is by using a dam, D-A-M. Water flows through turbines in a dam to produce electricity. That's how dams work. And these can be huge dams like the Hoover Dam or small projects like an underwater turbine or lower dams that are used on small rivers and streams. And smaller water bodies usually use run-of-river hydropower, which just uses a channel to funnel water to create electricity. So using water to create electricity was actually one of the first ways that electricity was generated in the United States, and hydropower was actually the largest annual source of total U.S. renewable electricity generation. In 2020, hydroelectric energy accounted for 22% of the renewable energy consumed in the U.S. So really, anywhere where water's flowing, hydroelectric energy can be produced. And this also doesn't use up that water. So the water keeps flowing even after it's produced the energy that we need. So that's why as long as there's water on Earth, we're going to be able to produce energy from it. And hydropower's been common for a while, but we can also generate energy from water in the ocean. Really? And this can be done by generating energy from ocean waves or from warm water surface temperatures. Wave energy is actually very predictable, so we usually know how much energy is going to be produced. So this type of energy can be useful for areas along the coast, along oceans, so that travel costs don't have to be crazy high. 
So we've been using water to create energy for a long time, and it's going to be important to do so in the future as well, because we've got these big dams, and now we can produce energy from the ocean. I mean, how about that? But now, let's get into our final two sources of green energy, which are probably going to be the most popular in the near future. You've probably heard of wind energy. We've been using wind energy with windmills for a long time, and no, they do not cause cancer. Nice try, buddy. But windmills have transitioned into wind turbines now, which are used to capture wind and turn it into energy. So when wind hits the wind turbines, the blades of the turbine turn around a rotor, which then spins a generator and creates electricity. And the wind turbines you're probably used to are those giant sticks with blades on them pointing in one direction. And usually these are grouped together in wind farms, so you can get all that wind, create some electricity. But these are the horizontal axis turbines. That's what they're called. But there are also vertical axis turbines, which are omnidirectional, which means it doesn't matter which way the wind is blowing, they're going to capture that energy regardless. Plus, I think they look cooler if you ever looked them up. Debatable. So when placed on land, wind turbines or wind farms are usually placed in areas that get lots of wind, so they can produce more energy. But wind turbines can also be placed on water, known as offshore wind turbines. These turbines can be placed on the ocean in order to capture strong ocean winds. And these can be huge, too. Like, some of these are taller than the Statue of Liberty. And in 2020, wind energy accounted for 26% of the renewable energy consumed in the U.S., which was second behind biomass. <laughs> However, since most wind turbines are built in rural areas with lots of land and lots of wind, that means that the energy generated from them needs to be transported long ways sometimes. That can cost money. Plus, large wind turbines create noise, which can be annoying living near big wind farms, which means, yeah, you don't want to live near them, so you're going to have to transport that energy. But wind turbines don't produce any carbon dioxide. They don't pollute the environment. They are 100% clean. And now here's something you might not have known. You can set up a wind turbine at your own home, if you wanted to. Wind turbines that you set up at your home are much smaller than those at wind farms, and they generate much less noise. Now, of course, you'll probably need to live in an area that has wind, but you probably do have wind. But usually, windier areas are known for having houses and businesses, like individual houses and businesses, that have their own little wind turbines. Now, of course wind doesn't occur all the time. So when wind is not happening, energy that was generated previously can be stored and used later. And since every location, house, and demand for electricity is different, the type or size or location of your wind turbine, it's going to depend for your location. So if that interests you, if you think that'd be cool, do your research because that actually does sound cool for some people. Like you probably need a bunch of land too for that to happen. So it's not for everybody. Did you know that? But basically, as long as there's wind in the air, we're going to be able to generate energy from it with no harm to the environment. Increasing our use of wind energy is going to be important in the future as we try to replace fossil fuels along with all of these. That's wind energy. But finally, let's talk about the green energy source that will matter most to you. Sanders Facts. Solar energy. What are you talking about? The most talked about green energy source has to be solar energy, even though it only accounted for 11% of the renewable energy that was consumed in the U.S. last year. But solar energy is captured using solar panels with PV cells that capture sunlight and turn it into energy. Just like wind, solar panels don't produce any carbon dioxide and they don't pollute the environment. And as long as the sun continues to shine, we can capture energy using solar panels. So unless the sun burns out or explodes or whatever, we can keep using solar panels. Now, of course, we have large solar panels that can be placed on roofs or any flat surface like a field. And then just like wind farms, we have solar farms, which have a lot of solar panels placed side by side where we can capture a ton of energy in sunny places usually, get that energy transported to other areas. However, solar panels can also be really small as well. Like you may have a solar watch or there may be a little solar panel on your calculator. Or I have a solar phone charger. Like solar panels can be really small. 
and there are a ton of small electronic devices that are powered only on solar, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, okay. And an advantage that solar has over wind is that it's not as location dependent. Like, you probably need to be in a windy area, not blocked by anything for a wind turbine. But that doesn't mean that we can place solar panels wherever we want, but while you can't place solar panels anywhere, any place that regularly gets sunlight during the day is probably a good bet to be a place where solar panels could work, and I think there's a lot more places that regularly get sunlight than get regularly heavy sustained winds. And additionally, the amount of sunlight on the Earth's surface gets is not a constant. So it does depend on location, but it also depends on time of day, what season of the year it is, and what the weather conditions are, because you're not going to have sunlight coming down on your solar panel 24-7. So a solution to that, because a lot of people are going to say, well, solar but the sun's not shining for half the day, what if it rains, so what am I going to do? Well, here's what you do. You get a large battery that can store energy generated by the solar panel so it can be used when it's not sunny. That, when it's sunny, that solar panel is generating an energy. But maybe you're not using a ton of energy. Well, then the unused energy gets stored so that when it's not sunny, you can use the energy that is not stored. How about that? That could be useful if you're putting solar panels on your homes. And while there are big solar farms that can capture sunlight and turn it into energy and we can hook those up to the grid, you can also put solar panels on the roof of your house. And it's usually a lot more feasible to place solar panels on your house instead of putting a wind turbine in your yard. So this is what many are considering the future for a lot of homes. But right now, the upfront cost is probably going to be a drawback for many because a lot of solar panel systems can cost between fifteen and $25,000. Like, it's pretty expensive. But however, if you're looking towards the future and you can afford it, let me just tell you, it's worth it. Well... Plus, there's also a couple of tax credits and rebates that you might want to look into as well, which can lower that cost. And solar panels will most likely save you a bunch in the long run. Like, 20-year savings range anywhere from $10,000 to almost $45,000. So, over 20 years, a solar energy system is probably going to pay for itself. And this is because... When you install solar panels, you won't be paying for any energy that you use that comes from the solar panels. Like, if you keep your house hooked up to the grid, you'd be able to use the solar panel energy, and the electric company's still gonna give you a bill, but it might be zero dollars because you haven't used any of their energy. But then if you run out of solar energy, or if you don't have a battery or anything to store the energy in when it's nighttime, then you can use the energy from the electric company, from the grid. So that's nice. But you also have the option of disconnecting your home from the grid. Too many facts. So in that case, you'd only be relying on your solar panels to provide you home energy. But that can be a plus during an outage, like a power outage, or a storm. Since you won't be affected, since you literally have your own grid. You've got the solar panels, you've got the battery, you don't need to hook up to any other grid. That's your power supply, so everybody else is struggling out there. We don't have any power! You've got power. There you go. But you'll probably need a decent-sized storage unit or a battery so you can go long periods without sunlight, but still have power. So that that's actually an added cost onto that fifteen and 25000 But again, tax credits, rebates, all that stuff, look into it if that sounds cool, because that sounds pretty cool to me. The truth lies here. Having my own little grid and not emitting, because when you're using power from the electric company and the electric grid, yeah, there's probably some solar and wind and geothermal in there, but there's also a lot of coal, a lot of oil, a lot of fossil fuels, which are not good, which are emitting, so... If you want to be self-sufficient, if you don't want to emit, that'd be a pretty good option, if you can afford it, because the upfront costs are low. But actually, in the last 10 years, solar panel system prices have dropped by about 
70%. That's cool. So prices are dropping because demand is increasing. More people want to put solar panels on their homes and it's becoming more affordable. The technology is becoming better. So that, as we go through time over the next few years, that's going to be more and more of an option. So solar power can be pretty awesome if you can afford it. It can literally replace the power company at your home. Plus, it's all clean, so you won't be polluting the environment. I mean, solar energy, how about that? So those are the five main green energy sources. So we've got those down, but there's also some other ways of helping keep the planet green. So like regular things in your home, weatherizing your home, heating and air conditioning, did you know this, account for almost half of home energy use. Seriously? By sealing drafts and insulating windows and openings in your home, you can make your home more energy efficient, so you won't be using as much energy. How about that? When you're shopping for appliances, shop for energy efficient Appliances, refrigerators, washing machines, you know the deal, that have an Energy Star label, those are the most efficient and those will save you on energy costs and usage. How about that? Reducing wastewater, because it takes a lot of energy to pump, heat, and treat water. So using less of it, along with using water efficient fixtures, helps. Because it was estimated that only one in a hundred homes in the US has water efficient fixtures. Terrible. So if we increased the use of those, we could help save more water, which would then be good because we need water and we're not using as much energy. And did you know that 40% of food in the U.S. winds up in the garbage? No. Yes. So maybe don't waste your food. Other ways, using public transportation, using LED light bulbs. I mean, these are just some of the ways that you can lead a more energy efficient life. And you're only one person and it takes a village. I know all that. But if we get a ton of people doing all these things, then differences are going to be made. But there is also another energy efficient resource that might be useful. It's one that is gaining momentum around the U.S., around the world. Here it comes! Electric vehicles. Oh, yes, because over the years, you've probably been seeing more and more electric vehicles out on the road, and that's a good thing. Like, a few years ago, if you saw a Tesla on the road, you were like, oh my gosh, that's a Tesla. Now they're everywhere. And there's other electric cars, too. Electric vehicles are automobiles that run not on gas, but on batteries that are powered by electricity. So no more gasoline. And electric vehicles are becoming incredibly popular and a great way to live a more energy efficient life because using gasoline pollutes the air. But if you go electric, that stops that pollution every time you drive. There you go. Good to know. However, there are some drawbacks right now. Oh, Xander, why would I ever get an electric vehicle? Electric vehicles are typically more expensive than their gasoline counterparts. However, prices are continuing to drop as demand is increasing for electric vehicles. A lot more people want them than a few years ago. Pretty soon, cost compared to gasoline-powered cars is probably not going to be that big of a drawback. Plus, right now there is a federal income tax credit of up to $7,500 for buying an electric vehicle and there are states around the country that are implementing their own tax credits and rebates for buying an electric vehicle so the sticker price is not the price you're going to be paying yum and the build back better bill that second bill that we've talked about that's in congress right now we've talked about that a ton on this podcast that just passed the house the other week and now of course needs to pass the senate but that would expand that tax credit up to twelve thousand five hundred dollars How about that? But another complaint from those hesitant to switch from gas to electric is range. And right now, the median per charge range of electric vehicles is 154 miles. Sander, that's horrible! But considering that the average American drives 29.2 miles per day, I'd say that's more than enough. And plus, if you do drive long distances a lot... There are electric vehicles that are getting 300, over 400 miles per a single charge now. The brand new ones that are coming out. So another thing about EVs 
is that the cost to charge them is a lot less than it is to fill up a regular car with gas. For one, you can actually charge your electric vehicle at home. Whoa. I know. How about that? All you have to do is install a charger, like inside of your garage, if you park in the garage, or outside on the side of your home, if you park outside. Of course, that can cost upwards of $1,000, so that's another expense there. But Consumer Reports actually found that the typical electric vehicle owner who does most of their fueling at home can expect to save an average of $800 to $1,000 a year on fueling their vehicle. Like, holy cow. This is a fact. And Consumer Reports also found that maintenance and repair costs are significantly lower for electric vehicles. The average dollar savings over the vehicle's lifetime is about $4,600. So again, there you go. And there's also a growing number of electric vehicle charging stations across the United States, and that number is going to continue to increase because the infrastructure bill, which has been passed and is now, I guess, the infrastructure law, that increased funds for charging stations for electric vehicles. So now there's even more places where you can charge your electric vehicle. And yes, it does take longer to charge an electric vehicle than it does to fill up a car with gas. But as technology continues to improve, battery technology, charging technology, that's going to improve. And the time it takes to charge an EV is going to continue to decrease because some of the new EVs can even charge at a public charging station in 15 minutes and they're good to go. And that's heavily increased over the years. So technology's getting better. Prices are going down. Electric vehicles are starting to make some more sense. However, another question. Are we done yet? Will our electric grid be able to keep up with the increasing demand in energy from electric vehicles? Well, if we continue to increase the number of wind farms, solar panels, and other renewable energy sources and add them to the grid, then, yeah, it probably will be able to keep up. Plus, you can always install solar panels on your own home, get off the grid, and then you have solar panels charging your electric vehicle at home. So, I mean, there you go. Like, while you're sleeping, your vehicle can charge. So, you can get home from a long day of driving all over town and all over place, and your battery's almost dead, but plug it in, go to sleep, wake up, and it's fully charged. Guaranteed! You won't have to stop in any gas station or charging station, you know, because you'll be filled up. Ready to go. So, there you go. Electric vehicles. They're making more sense than ever. And plus, they're much more energy efficient than gasoline-powered vehicles. So, we need a lot more of those on the road. And a bunch of companies, I mentioned Tesla, but there's other companies, some of them you've heard of, some of them you might not have heard of. There's companies like Rivian and Lucid, which are new EV companies, which are only making electric vehicles. But there's companies like Ford and GM right here in the U.S. making electric vehicles. And Volkswagen and Mercedes and BMW and all these companies are making electric vehicles. So you're going to have more options. And plus, the costs are going to keep going down. It doesn't take as much money to charge electric vehicles. It costs less to maintain them. So, I mean, they're better in the long run. And hopefully, more and more people are going to get on the electric vehicle bandwagon because that's a good thing. So now let's review everything I just talked about because the current way life functions in the United States and around the world is not sustainable. As we've learned from the UN report back in August, the COP26 summit was all about this. If we keep using fossil fuels and non-renewable resources to power everything we want and need, there are going to be some serious consequences for all of us. The Earth is going to rapidly warm, which is going to cause a lot of bad things to happen in the environment. Plus, we're going to run out of fossil fuels eventually, so we could just keep powering with fossil fuels. But we're going to run out of them eventually. And if we're not prepared when we do to switch over to clean and renewable energy, then that's going to have a detrimental cost. So, switching over to green renewable energy sources is the main thing that we as a society have to do 
in order to fight the effects of climate change. And while the larger effort is going to take, you know, actual governments, China, the US, Russia, India, these huge governments to actually implement policies that disincentivize fossil fuels, we regular human beings can also take steps to help protect our planet. So there you go. That's my spiel for this week. It's a green Thanksgiving, green energy, Xander's Facts. So there you have it. That is this week's Xander's Facts flashback, a green Thanksgiving. A lot of facts on there about green energy, clean energy, all stuff that is good for the planet or better than coal and oil, which are bad for the planet. But thank you all for listening. And remember, if you liked all the facts that you heard on this week's Xander's Facts Flashback, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, rate and review the podcast, then go on all your socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, like, heart, follow Xander's Facts, that's Xander with a Z. And most importantly, remember to tell all your friends, spread the facts, Xander's Facts Podcast. Tell me about Xander's Facts on YouTube because you can watch the Xander's Facts Flashback on YouTube. Check that out. And Xander's Weekend Facts on Substack, our newsletter, which you can sign up for in the special link in this episode's description to get it every Sunday morning. Check that out. And check out the Xander's Facts link tree. It has got every Xander's Facts link that you need. So there you go. That's this week's Xander's Facts flashback here for Wednesday, August 10th, 2022. And next week, we're going to have one more Xander's Facts flashback before the podcast returns on Wednesday, August 24th. That's when the next brand new episode of this podcast comes out, episode 73. But next week, August 17th, we're going to have another Xander's Facts flashback. And it is going to be a topic that I know you are going to like. So check it out next week, Xander's Facts Flashback. But that is it. That is a wrap for this week's Xander's Facts Flashback. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see y'all with another Xander's Facts Flashback next week. Many facts.